Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed iron workers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship. At a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back at Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall where they took us back to on buses and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out and you want to win the championship. Win the championship, that is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is going to be forever. Your name's going to be a part of it, and you're going to be associated with a great cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West, and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup, and the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would for, turn them down. They said, if you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head on to the man known as the big train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to leave because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Konica resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
we didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And uh, the, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that, for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle, and he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the Depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Annis Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let him play. We give him great uniforms. We go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. Uh, I used to die in the cold. Uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. Uh, you literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand on the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I was like, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and from their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game, or five minutes of that game, uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the cars, and that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared or dared to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in in 19 around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old-timers equipment from a year or two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, 
The Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team west as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson Top fans, Indian Chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Grey Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfasts, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension. And uh, from that time on, I think almost every Grey Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return. It may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
more than a century, Winnipeg has been a home to Canadian football. While teams may have presented an air of sophistication, the early days of football in Manitoba were known more for bone-crunching collisions on prairie fields, and the stars of the day were both athletes and brawlers. Winnipeg won the West's first Grey Cup in 1935 when they marched into Hamilton and defeated the powerful Hamilton Tigers with the incredible Fritzy Hansen, the West's first superstar, leading the charge. In 1950, the Bombers challenged the Argonauts at Toronto's Varsity Stadium in a Grey Cup game forever known as the Mud Bowl. The Mud Bowl game was one of the great disasters in the CFL. What happened, of course, is that we had a sudden uh, snowstorm on the night before the game, and then it started to melt. And what we ended up with was slush. It was the most deplorable conditions that you could ever think of. So bad that one of the Winnipeg players, Buddy Tinsley, he fell down face down in the water, and the referee, Heck Crichton, turned him over. Or poor old Tinsley might have drowned. But any of, in any event, uh, Winnipeg had Indian Jack Jacobs, and we thought, thought they had a great passing attack. We never found out, because they couldn't throw the ball. And the Argos were able to win it. Although he never brought the Bombers a Grey Cup, Indian Jack Jacobs' spectacular passing made him a fan favorite. In 1953, Jacobs had a new target, an all-star from the NFL's Philadelphia Eagles, Harry Bud Grant. You know, I arrived in Winnipeg as a player in 1953, and I remember going to the first practice, and we went out to Assiniboine Park to practice because our practice field was wet or underwater or something. And I got out there, and I never saw so many people. We had a hard time practicing because there were so many people there to watch practice. There was never a question as to the Bombers' popularity. Football was practically a way of life, especially if your father was the legendary voice of the Bombers, Cactus Jack Wells. As a kid growing up in Winnipeg, everybody was a Blue Bomber fan, and when your father was the voice of the Blue Bombers, uh, you were an even bigger fan. But living in Winnipeg and, and growing up with uh, a father who was the voice of the football team, it was pretty easy to be uh, absolutely taken by what went on. In Winnipeg, the Bombers were always front page news. In 1957, the top story was 29-year-old Bud Grant's transition from player to head coach. In his time, Bud Grant was the greatest student of the game of Canadian football that there was. And, and I mean, it proved that with the success he had, knowing what it took to create a win. Grant promptly installed a bold new offense, known as the Wing T, and recruited the perfect quarterback to run it, University of Iowa star Kenny Plain. I had the opportunity to come here because of what Bud Grant, as a new coach, wanted as an offense, and he felt I would fit as an uh, offensive quarterback. And actually, the Canadian football game was made for this particular offense. I figured that the wing T, as, as, we, as we called it at that time, uh, was the way to, uh, to be successful up here. Well, playing, of course, was the best at it that there was. I can remember the first play I called. I ran for about 12, 13 yards for a first down, and the stadium went crazy. <laughs> I guess they had never seen a running quarterback in this league uh, on Winnipeg's team anyway. Quarterbacks make headlines because linemen make blocks. In 1958, Grant signed another wing T specialist from the University of Iowa, future Hall of Famer Frank Rigney. He was probably the... Uh, perfect individual to fit in with the Canadian boys because he could move, run with them, uh, do everything you needed to do in the wing tee offense. I really, really loved football and wanted to know and understand every play. And I wanted to understand it from every position of the offensive players. I knew exactly what the quarterback was trying to do, what the receivers were trying to do, and it helped me do my job against people who are sometimes uh, quite difficult to block. In the late 1950s, Bud Grant and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers enjoy the luxury of two equally talented quarterbacks, Kenny Plain and Jim Van Pelt. Jim Van Pelt and, and Kenny Plain shared the quarterbacking duties for the Blue Bombers. When they weren't 
quarterbacking the team. They could also play other positions. The two quarterback system could drive a lot of teams crazy because you could send both of them out onto the field and uh, you never really knew which one was going to be the quarterback. In the mid-50s, a tip from a writer who heard it from a railroad porter brought the Bombers a running back from Lincoln College in Missouri, the great Leo Lewis. Leo Lewis is the greatest player I ever had. The greatest player, no question about it. He could do everything. Uh, he had instincts of a, a natural football player. He could block, he could run, he could catch. He played every minute of every down of every game. He was without a doubt in my mind the best player I've ever been associated with on a football field. In 1958, with Van Pelt at quarterback and playing at defensive halfback, Bud Grant's wing tee offense paid off and Winnipeg celebrated a thrilling 35-28 Grey Cup win over Hamilton. If you ask me what was the greatest thrill of I've had in, in sports or athletics, winning that Grey Cup in Vancouver probably is the ultimate in terms of what it meant to me because it justified all everything I'd done and I'd been here and coaching and playing and whatnot. And now I feel I'd, I was somewhat fulfilled. Probably gave me as much satisfaction as anything I've ever done in sports. We had the biggest homecoming I think a team has ever had. <laughs> it was sub-zero uh, temperatures. People were lined up on the street from the airport all the way over to the arena. Nobody cared when we had our parade and it was 30 below zero. And we had, you couldn't drink out of the Grey Cup because your lips would be frozen to it. But the town turned out there was thousands and tens of thousands of people lining Portage Avenue to welcome us back. Five times in six years, the Bombers met the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the Grey Cup final. The Bombers won four. But none more dramatic than in 1961, when quarterback Kenny Plain twisted his way into the end zone to record the first overtime win in Grey Cup history. Kenny Plain knew how to win football games. He knew what to do. And I think that he and Coach Grant meshed immensely well in preparing offensively to play other teams. Bud Grant knew what he was doing when he picked up a guy like that, and I think that uh, he, he was uh, just one of the, the stalwarts with the football club there and certainly one of the great players ever to, to play in this league. Fans expected another exciting battle when they poured into Toronto for the Bombers Ticats Grey Cup in 1962. Instead, they got what came to be known as the greatest game we never saw, the Fog Bowl. ABC was going to televise the game in the States for the first time, prime time national television. Now the advantage to that was, of course, exposure, which helps in our recruiting of players. And I thought, well, this is going to be great. Then the fog comes in. It soon became a game of running plays. Passes and punts went up and disappeared. Finally, with less than 10 minutes to go and the Bombers up by one, Commissioner Sid Halter called a timeout. We went into the dressing room, sat there working on strategy, of what we were going to call and what we were going to do, and we came back on the field only to find out they came in and said the game had been called. Too much fog, uh, they were going to come back the next morning. We had from then until the next day to call the next play. It's the longest I ever had to think about a play. We had a meeting that night, we had a meeting in the morning, you know, we, we had a meeting in the locker room, and we come out in the field, warmed up, and got ready to call the play. I still wasn't sure what we were going to run. It was tough. After playing a full season and uh, almost a full game the day before, to play the next morning, to put tape back on to your raw skin and try to get stretched back out from the Charlie horses and the contact if you had the previous day. There were a number of players that couldn't even suit up. They need never have bothered to finish the game. When the teams returned to the field, no points were scored, and the Bombers hoisted their fourth Grey Cup in five years. In 1965, the Ticats got a chance for revenge, as Toronto hosted a windblown Grey Cup that would leave Bomber fans second-guessing Bud Grant. If you've ever been in that stadium, you know in Toronto that the wind howls down there, and, and uh, to throw the ball against the wind or to kick the ball was almost an impossible endeavor. Facing the strong winds, punting proved futile. Three times when the Bombers found themselves pinned deep in their own zone, 
Grant elected to concede a two-point safety touch in order to retain possession of the ball. Bud Grant made very, very few bad decisions as far as I was concerned during the nine years that I played under him. And certainly giving up those safety touches uh, in no way was incorrect. We just couldn't move the ball. And uh, Hamilton couldn't either, but we lost by those six points. While the Winnipeg Blue Bombers struggled through much of the 70s, the team did find their share of stars. 1974 saw the arrival of a quarterback who could throw like none other, Ralph Dieter Brock. When I talk about my favorite Blue Bombers, I have to start with Dieter Brock, Ralph Dieter Brock. I'm a lover of pure passers in football. He was your classic drop back quarterback. I loved watching Dieter Brock throw the football because he threw it unlike anybody that I've seen in the CFL. While Brock made headlines, there was little fanfare in 1980 when an unheralded kicker arrived for training camp. Based on his track record, no one could have guessed that Bob Cameron would be on the roster for the next two decades. I was drafted in the first round by Edmonton and I thought, geez, I'm just gonna be able to make the next step to the pros and that'll be it and I'll have a long career. And uh, I got to Edmonton and uh, first round pick and it was the first cut. And so it went from there to uh, Calgary Stampeders, tried out there, it was cut again. In 1978, tried out for Philadelphia uh, Eagles, uh, was cut there, went to Ottawa Rough Riders, was cut there, Hamilton Ticats, cut there, back to university for one last year, and then I tried out for Buffalo Bills the next year, cut again, and basically I thought my career was over until uh, Winnipeg phoned me in the fall of 79 and asked me if they wanted to come out in the, in the spring and it was sort of embarrassing when you've tried out that many times and never even played it down until your fourth year of trying out but I wasn't willing to give it up. Successful football teams need both character and characters. The Bombers found both in one hulking package. The unfriendly giant Chris Walby. Chris Walby should have been a defensive player and the reason why I say that is because defensive people have attitude. Uh, they're supposed to have attitude. You're supposed to be nasty and have a nasty attitude. And Chris Walby was the only offensive lineman I had seen in my playing time and in my coaching time that has an attitude like that. I mean, like, he used to be downright nasty and mean. Every week, you have to peak at a certain time and turn ultra-aggressive to, to basically look to destroy and maim the player you're playing against and knock the snot out of somebody across from me. You know, and that was what I lived for. In 1983, quarterback Dieter Brock staged a one-man strike in an attempt to get his release to play in the United States. Instead, the Bombers sent him east to Hamilton in a swap for quarterback Tom Clements. Tom had the ability to really use his weapons. And that means handing the ball off dump passes, little screen passes, misdirection. And what Tommy could really do well was surgically take you apart. I've never played with a guy that was as, who I thought had such a grasp of the game as, as Tom Clemens. He was a surgeon on the football field. He just could do so many things. And he had defenses just reeling. He didn't, they didn't know if it was a run, a pass, play action, a side out, a hitch pass. He just, he you know, he just did everything he had to do. The trade set up a storybook 1984 Grey Cup. The Tie Cats and Brock versus the Bombers and Clements. But it was no contest. Winnipeg's defense mauled their ex teammate, and the Bombers ran away with the game 47 17. Winning the Grey Cup, grabbing a hold of that thing, for a Canadian kid, this is the pinnacle. I mean, for me as a football player, I was. You, you can't imagine how. Um, you know, even, even though I think I was 30 years old at the time, this, this was something I dreamed of my, my whole life. It was such a wonderful, wonderful, unbelievable feeling. This is something that everybody plays for. And to be able to hold it, and knowing that on those little silver-plated name tags of the teams where every player on that team is etched in that thing for life, we were gonna be there. I was gonna be a piece of this traveling showcase. It was unbelievable. It was just the greatest feeling in the world. In 
In 1987, the Montreal Alouettes folded, and the league needed to realign the conferences. Winnipeg was suddenly an eastern city. Everything we did was Western Conference. I mean, all our rivalries were Western Conference. We were losing all that. You know, there was Edmonton and uh, Calgary, and then we had a great rivalry going with BC, too. And Labor Day with Saskatchewan and whatnot. And you're giving all that up. The fans hated it that we were in the Eastern Conference. We'd build up these huge rivalries all the way through. I know as players, we thought the Eastern Conference was always the weakest conference, at least it had been for a number of years. And we thought, boy, if we go to the Eastern Conference, we're going to be in the Grey Cup every year. And the Blue Bombers did win the Grey Cup in 1988, beating the BC Lions on a late interception, and little else but the toe of Bob Cameron. The 1988 game in Ottawa was a game that we won without any offense. We had one offensive running first down in the whole game. Completed two passes in the second half. Bob Cameron was sensational. It was an extremely windy day. I fortunately had a pretty darn good game punting, and I guess it was a factor, a big factor in us winning the game. When you win by one point, then you can really look to the kicking game, and I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to win the uh, Outstanding Canadian. East or West, every Grey Cup win is a triumph. As Bob Cameron basked in the glory of victory, he added yet another chapter to his already unique CFL resume. My contract was uh, a lot different than most. Um, we, we got the odd perk. When, when, mo most guys would ask for a perk, ask for a car during the season, or ask for uh, a house to live in, or put up an apartment, or whatever. And um, I asked for lumber from a lumber store so that I could build my rental houses or build additions onto my own house. He comes to practice, he's got drywall dust all over him because he rebuilds homes and fixes up all these places he buys. He's got screws in his pocket, he's got electrical cords hanging off his belt. I swear, he only played football so he could shower. In 1990, coach Mike Riley and the Bombers were back in the Grey Cup against Edmonton. With quarterback Tom Burgess dissecting the Eskimos' defense, Winnipeg romped to a 50-11 victory. The jubilant Bombers celebrated their second Grey Cup championship under head coach Mike Riley. To go into the locker room afterwards and see guys that excited. Me being a rookie wasn't sure exactly what this meant to all the players of the CFL. And just to see the looks in the guys in the veterans' uh, eyes, just the way that they were admiring that trophy and knowing that it's their trophy, uh, it was very, I guess that's when it really hit. This is what everybody plays for. Nothing, nothing in the world beats winning a Grey Cup. Nothing. No matter what you do and no matter what kind of high you think you're getting on, nothing beats it than winning a championship ring. After one more season in Winnipeg, quarterback Tom Burgess was gone. And suddenly, the Bombers had themselves a problem. The Bombers, after the 91 season, were in desperate need of a quarterback. And Cal Murphy decided that he needed to go out and get a marquee quarterback. And wouldn't you know that Matt Dunnigan was on the market. And it didn't take him very long before he had uh, the city eating out of his hand. If Matt walked into the locker room and he sauntered and he had his cocky, abrasive brashness about him, we are going to win. We were going to win that football game. I don't care who we're playing. We're going to win. Matt is a very cocky quarterback. He knows how good he is, and he can get the job done. I was a warrior, and, you know, I'm, I don't have a problem saying it. I was a warrior, and I was a SOB to play with. You know, and I was like, whatever it took, I was going to get the job done. And when you started something, you gave it your best effort. And anything else was not acceptable. But the Dunnigan signing was suddenly overshadowed by a blow that rocked Winnipeg. Coach Cal Murphy's heart problems had worsened. He would require a transplant. I remember going to the hospital in Winnipeg and taking the game plans <laughs> to Cal. And He's laying there, virtually in, on his deathbed, you know, waiting for a heart, something to come through. And we're going over game plans, because it's what we love to do. When I had the transplant, to me, it was just another step in life. And the doctors there assured me there's no reason why I shouldn't carry on doing what I'm doing. Right after the transplant, they had me up and walking. <laughs> it's pretty good. 
In 1994, quarterback Matt Dunnigan recorded a performance like none other. As the Bombers faced the Edmonton Eskimos, Dunnigan put on the greatest aerial display in CFL history, throwing for an amazing 713 yards. Matt could have had more. I mean, he missed a couple. It just, just missed, you know, and it just, on those almost passes, you know, when the fans go ooh instead of boo. Well, uh, if he had had those, I think he might have hit 800. While Matt Dunnigan and coach Cal Murphy would move on, new eras bring new stars and rekindled hope. As a new generation looks on, their heroes in Bomber Blue are back where they belong in the Western Conference, battling for the right to raise the Grey Cup again, to write yet another chapter in the CFL's illustrious history. We've got a great team. I think it's growing in the right direction. I think we're smart. We've got good owners for a change. I think that the fan base has come back up. The TV's ratings are gone up. I, th I only look for positive things from this league. Well, uh, what, mosquitoes, Winnipeg, Winnipeg mosquitoes, I don't know what came first, but one of the interesting <laughs> things when American players come here for the first time, not Canadians, because Canadians know about mosquitoes, but when Americans come here, um, they can't believe how many mosquitoes we have and how big they are and what voracious appetites they have. They're just blown away. You hear two things from players south of the border about Winnipeg when they come up here is, is the wind, how windy it is, and it is windy in Winnipeg, windiest corner in the world, right? Portage and Maine. I'm not sure that's true, but it makes a good story. And the mosquitoes, and we do have some serious mosquitoes, and I can remember many bomber training camps where players have <laughs> been swatting every, every part of their body and kind of looking to the looking to the sky and, and as if they're going to get some answer as to what this is. Where do these things come from? They were pretty good at game day out at the stadium, but boy, I can tell you, went over to Canada Packers and with the odor that drifted over from the packing houses and the weeds and the trees and everything else, bushes that were surrounded that practice field, there were days there that the mosquitoes could literally drive you right off the practice field. We had thick pants back then that I remember that we wore, like, uh, you know, they almost seemed to be, you know, to keep you warm, I guess, but they almost seem like they're like an eighth of an inch thick. And these mosquitoes would go right through your pants to, to get you, you know? That and it'd be buzzing your ear hole and your helmet and stuff, and I'll tell you what, it was just, it was crazy. I get a little tired of hearing it, I have to admit, you know, deal with it, right? You know, you guys play with sprained ankles and broken legs and, and a few mosquitoes are gonna throw you off, but they do, those little devils. To be a successful coach, you had to have a patient wife, a loyal dog, and a great quarterback, but not necessarily in that order. The coaching of the day of the game at Canadian football to me was fascinating. I mean, really enjoyable. There's a lot more to coaching in the Canadian Football League than there is in the National Football League. I mean, down there now with stadiums, artificial turf, you know, I say, okay, you call heads or tails, and from that point on, everything's automatic. Up here with the weather, you know, and all the, 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 the variances in the rules and the scoring, uh, the three downs, I mean, all that make, makes a different coaching game out of it, where you have things you have to consider 
uh, that aren't by the book kind of thing. But we played a game in Calgary one time <clears throat> and we took the wind because I called the weather bureau and I, the weather was unsettled. And they said, well, the wind is going to change around and it's going to be variable and it's going to come. And you know, you know how Calgary, when it comes out of the foothills, those winds, they can change. Well, after due consideration, we ended up, we had the wind for four quarters because I called the weather bureau and I knew what was going to happen and, and approximately when it was going to happen. Well, somebody said, well, you're the luckiest dog in the world. Well, yeah, I was lucky, but it turned out that I happened to know which way the wind was coming from, too. The celebration of the Grey Cup, I thought, was a great celebration. I mean, we played in Toronto when you had the, you know, the Royal York Hotel would be emptied and people were on the streets all night. As a matter of fact, we'd, we'd tell our players, go out and enjoy it. Just don't, be doing, don't drink and come back at a reasonable time and enjoy this. Let you, you know, get involved with what's happening. We felt that helped us as a team to be a part of that celebration. I thought... Canadian football was more a part of the, the fabric of Canada than it is, let's say, in the States. It became more, at, at least in that era, it was really, really an important thing, and we felt we were proud to be a part of it. My earliest memories of Canadian football come from being the son of a legendary broadcaster. Cactus Jack Wells was the voice of the Bombers for many, many years. He was associated with the team for 50 years. And my memories go back to sitting in the stands, and I remember the seat number, section four, row four, seat 11 and 12, and sitting with my mom and listening to Dad call the games on radio at the time. Jack Wells was the, one of the first guys that I met here, and it never took himself too seriously. I mean, he could be critical, of what was going on and make fun of it, but you knew it wasn't anything malicious. It was, he was making fun, he was doing his job, and you know, he knew where his heart was. Well, Jack Wells is famous for giving out nicknames, and I don't like to fly. I'm a very fearful flyer. And one of the first flights we took as a, as a crew, he and I and Ken Plain, covering the Blue Bombers, I was holding onto my seat as we took off, and of course the knuckles get white, and everybody's familiar, I think, with the phrase, the white knuckle flyer, and Jack looked over and laughed, that cackle of his, and said, you're gonna have to be called Knuckles. Well, that was it. As soon as Jack gives you a nickname, it's there for good, and Knuckles Irving was my moniker from that moment on. And you know what? I have no problem with it, never have had, because it was given to me by the legendary Jack Wells. The bomber legends and the wonderful nicknames that uh, came along with them. I, I think uh, when you look at that, Jack Wells gave a lot of people those nicknames. And uh, the bomber legends were very strong. Leo Lewis was an outstanding running back. He was the Lincoln locomotive. There was a fullback in that same era whose name was Charlie Shepard, and, and he was the punter on the team and, and held a record for a long time of the longest punt in Canadian football history, 92 yards. I mean, there was a little wind behind it, but Charlie got it up there. And that was Charlie Choo Choo Shepard. And then there was another Canadian running back who was Lorne Boom Boom Benson. There was Cease Looning, who was the Selkirk Milkman. And it was, it was a wonderful time for, for nicknames and, and for, for great athletes. We were up in Edmonton one time and, and uh, he got in a fight with Jack Jacobs and Jack uh, hit him pretty hard, you know, and bloodied his nose. He had to go on television or radio or something with a fat lip, but uh, he didn't hold that against Jack, and they had a couple drinks or something after the game. Uh, but, no, he was uh, one of my favorite people. The weather in Winnipeg, of course, uh, wasn't the greatest thrill to play in uh, a lot of the time. Um, I can tell you this, that um, teams didn't like coming there because of the weather, uh, but we didn't like it all that much either. Uh, Bud Grant had a rule that we were not allowed to have any heaters on the bench. We could not have any extra clothing on. We couldn't wear gloves, for example. The other teams did all of these things. As a matter of fact, in Winnipeg, the visiting bench had these nice warm heaters when you came off the field, and we were over there freezing to death. They called it getting acclimated. I never really understood that.
I learned something in Canada that I carried over in the National Football League, and that is you can play in cold weather. You can play when you're cold, and you can play well when you're cold, and your hands don't have to have encased in gloves, and you don't have to have long underwear on, and you don't have to have all those other paraphernalia on, and we didn't allow our players to have that. We didn't wear gloves, if you remember, when, in, and, and we played, and I, I taught them a trick. And I said, if you clap your hands real hard until they sting real hard, man, they're going to hurt and sting, and then stop. Your hands, will, the blood will rush in your hands, and they'll be nice and warm. It's an old Eskimo trick. Along with Leo Lewis, uh, we had some other great running backs. Uh, the first one I think of is Jerry James, who was known as Kid Dynamite because his father had played in this particular league previous to him. And uh, Jerry was an unusual athlete. He played sport professionally both on the National Hockey League and the Canadian Football League in the same years. He played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. When you talk about a competitor, uh, you could throw him the football six times in practice, he'd fumble it. You threw it to him on third and one in a major football game that he had to catch it. He not only caught it, but he ran with it after he caught it. He was one of the great athletes of all time. And the year he broke his leg playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, he came back to Winnipeg for the winter for the first time in some time and ended up coaching our hockey team. So when you lived in Winnipeg in those days, you knew all kinds of people, but you knew the Winnipeg football team. Bud Grant has always been known as very much of a loner, and yeah, he was very much that way. He uh, was a hunter and a fisherman and a football coach. And if you didn't hunt or fish or play football, you didn't have a lot of conversations with Bud Grant. He's a great outdoors person. Uh, he's a, a Bud Grant type person when he hunts and fishes. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, if you got lost in the woods somewhere and uh, didn't have a compass or whatever with you and needed to survive, uh, and I had a choice of picking somebody to take with me, uh, I think it would be Bud Grant of coming out alive because uh, he's that type of an individual. The only problem, if one of us had to go, I'd be the one that would go because he'd look after Bud first. I remember the legendary stories of Bud Grant taking rookies out on hunting trips. And he would take them out into the marsh and Grant would uh, hide them down and, and say, we're gonna wait for the ducks to arrive here now. And uh, they'd sit there for two, three, four hours. And about in the fourth hour, the legend was that Bud Grant would reach into his pocket I need a chocolate bar in front of this rookie football player. And this kid was starving at the time. He thought he was going out for a half hour. And uh, Grant would calmly look at the guy and suggest that, you know, the next time you should come a little more prepared and let that be a life's lesson to you for wherever you go. Always think ahead and be prepared. I had uh, really no ambition to play professional football and had not really thought about it. I was going to go to law school and uh, I was very, very surprised being drafted as high, high as I was in the NFL. And uh, after talking to the Philadelphia Eagles who drafted me uh, number three, back in those days of course there was only 12 teams so I, I guess I was in the top 30 people drafted in the United States. I was told the second offensive lineman out of uh, the U.S. that year. Uh, but uh, a couple of people preceded me to Winnipeg from the University of Iowa, Calvin Jones, Frank Gilliam, and of course Kenny Plain. And uh, they all just thought it was a fantastic league, uh, great coach and Bud Grant, and uh, I agreed and finally came to Winnipeg. And I drove straight from uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to Winnipeg uh, with a 20-day-old son in the back seat. And I got a hold of Bud Grant when I arrived in Winnipeg and he said, kid, get on the plane tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. We're going to our first preseason game. Uh, I had no idea uh, how big the field was, uh, the yard off the ball, or any of the other rules uh, in Canada that differed from the United States. 
But we went down to Montreal and got beat 53 to nothing. The great thing about that trip that I recall was that after the game, of course, everybody was down about the loss, but we immediately got on the plane and flew to Toronto, uh, where we arrived uh, early Sunday morning. And I said, what the heck are we doing here? Are we changing planes? And they said, no, we're playing tomorrow uh, against Toronto. Uh, a long weekend, two games during the weekend. Of course, in university, we only played 10 games all year. I was in Canada three days and had played with a team that got beat 81-6 to six by two Eastern teams, and I didn't know what was going on. You know, when I think about offensive line, I think of, one, I think of a swing in perception. One was that, remember growing up as a kid, and I, and I was a very skinny kid as a kid, so I never really played O-line, but who did you pick to play O-line? It was the fat kid. The fat kid that couldn't move. There was a perception that, and maybe to this day, with minor kids playing football, that the non-athlete would be put on the O-line. That's our last picks. We put them on the O-line. We don't worry about those guys. As you get into more and higher levels of football, I think the biggest thing I realized was, wow, this is a cerebral part of the game. You gotta be able to block, you gotta be able to make snap decisions. You got defenses that can move and you can't. You've gotta be able to make that call and you gotta work as a team because your five guys have to work together. So I, I think the biggest thing that I learned as, a, as an offense alignment is one that I, I really believe we are the cornerstone of that football club. I know your quarterback's the key, but your quarterback can't do nothing with the big guys up front. And if, you're, if your line is not good or you're not working together, your quarterback's gonna get killed. It's as simple as that, and you know it and I know it. You go to any team, I don't care what league you're in, NFL, CFL, arena, wherever it is, your offensive linemen, they are the big boys in the locker room. They are the ones that run the lock. They are the owners. We are the boss. We are the sumo wrestlers. We sit back there. You know what? We want food brought, it's brought to us. We want music changed, we'll get up and change it. Most of the time we don't, because that means we have to walk too far. So we just let whatever's being played. Every once in a while we'll throw a country day on, but that's just to throw everybody off. Beer, it better be brought to us, and it better be cold. I used to have guys bring it, and I'd say, you know what, if you're gonna bring me beer, don't just bring me the beer. Make sure it's in a bag of ice, so when I get off the field, it's ice cold, just the way I like it. That's the way it is with an offensive line. I mean, you know what? It's when, from a small kid getting no respect to playing in the pro leagues getting all the respect. All the jokes about Bob Cameron and his slurpy runs. And it, there was a training camp in Brandon where he went out and got slurpees during practice because the kickers weren't asked to do anything. Cal Murphy didn't make the kickers do much of anything. They kicked at the start of practice during some of the kicking drills, and then he sent them off on their own. He said, you know, you guys go and do what you want, go and do it where you want, just don't bother the real football players. Well, what happened was the offensive linemen, guys like Chris Walby, would be getting after the kickers. They'd see us on the sidelines, they'd be smashing their heads together like two bulls smashing together to, and, um, on, on Wild Kingdom or something like that. And so we'd, we'd be watching this and they'd be looking at us just sitting on our helmets on the sidelines and you know giving us some wise, wisecracks. So Trevor Kennard and I decided one day when, uh, during practice we got in our car and went, went to 7-Eleven uh, and loaded up with enough slurpees for the offensive line. And then we raced right on the middle of the field, stopped practice, opened up the hatch, it was a hatchback car we had, and uh, brought out all these slurpees for the, for the, really for the offensive lineman. And we were just really trying to make friends with him. And, and Cal loved it. He thought this was a great idea. You know, it just um, took away from the monotony. And so after that, they thought that that's all we did was go and get slurpees. And so that's how, how all that, that started that, you know, if they, never, if they ever see the kickers going into the locker room during practice, they think for sure we're going for a slurpee run, and we aren't. We're, we're, we're basically in there watching TV. That's what we're doing. I really believed in the concept of team. We all have our positions, we all have our duties, we have our responsibilities. If they all don't do it, we don't, we're not gonna get any success. Um, how do I view the pencil necks? The DBs, the receivers, these little guys that scat all over the place. Uh, you know what? I think they're great. I've got some great uh, uh, memories of guys like Benny Thompson, 
who I, from the years I played, pound for pound, may have been the toughest SOB I've ever played with. I mean, he would knock himself out. Every time the coaches would say, Benny, relax, it's an extra point. Benny would go over the top, get chopped, land on his helmet, knock himself out. Every time. The guy, was, I mean, he kept a smelling salt company in business. They kept coming back, trying to wake him up every time. I, res I love the guy for that. So I love, I think the thing that old linemen like and what they're attracted to, toughness. You could be a running back, you could be a receiver, show me some toughness. You show me toughness, you are what we call an honorary old lineman. And that's, it's funny because we'll have, we'll have uh, little get-togethers. And everybody wants to hang with the old lineman because we got the beers and we got the food and we're going to have a party. We would have honorary allowances. So we would say, okay, you could come and be an old lineman today. We're granting you this. And they would come and they'd party with us and they'd become an honorary old lineman. So it was kind of a neat thing. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers, uh, they do it every game. They score a touchdown and all five of them will get over there and celebrate together. And they do it as a, five as a unit because they play as a unit. So when one scores, they all score. And they all party, they all celebrate together in the end zone. I heard uh, a few, I remember Angelo Mosca, he told me one day, uh, you know, I'm from the old school. You guys shouldn't allow those guys to dance in the end zones like that. But I'm from the new school. And those guys, if they want to dance, as long as it's not hurting anybody, and as long as they're not taunting, they're not dancing in front of the bench of the other team, they're dancing in their end zone where they scored. I don't see nothing wrong with it. You know, I find the game of football is entertainment. People pay their dollar to come and get entertained. James West used to entertain people in Winnipeg. When he made a sack, they play Wild Wild West. Remember that? I hated that song because I was playing in Hamilton at the time. But he, they used to play it constantly. He was very good. Entertainment. Tyrone Jones used to make plays and he'd just go wild and people loved it. You know? But he wasn't taunting anybody. He was entertaining the fans. I think individuals should keep their individuality. If an individual feels like doing that, pulling out a pin out of a sock and signing the football, I think that's up to him, and I think that it should be allowed. Me, I wasn't one of those type of people. I got an interception, I immediately threw the ball into the stands, right? I wanted somebody to go home with that pick. Until my last year, I kept every last one of them, so I have 11 footballs at home. Don't tell anybody. But uh, I think that everybody should keep their individuality. As a defensive back, if a receiver beats me in the end zone, he wants to dance or whatever, I'm not going to watch it anyway. I'm going to walk away from him. I'm not going to see it. He can do whatever he wants to. I let him get in there. It should be shame on me for letting him get in there. That's my punishment for having to watch. Superstition. We all live with it. I, uh, I was tremendously superstitious to the point where I'd throw fits in the locker room. Uh, we're talking about aggression before. This is where I displayed an aggression. This is four hours before the game. I always had to be there four hours before the game. Never took the team bus ever. We always took a cab over. About a group of us would go over to the game early, get to the stadium. But I had to have a garbage can filled with ice and I had to be into the shower and I'd have to stand in this for 20 minutes. Filled with ice. This is minus 30, whatever it is. In the, and, and, you know, it's, it's unbearable. But I, psychologically, I believe this made me faster. That it slowed everything down. And then when I got out, the blood increased the flow. And then I got my ankles taped. And I felt that this is what I had to do. I never played crib like a lot of guys before games. I would just, that was one of my big superstitions was to make sure I was there early. That I had my cold tub. And you better have that cold tub ready. And you better have the ice ready. And I remember we used to travel to some stadiums and they didn't have any ice. Or the ice wasn't there yet. And I would be going ballistic because this was cutting into my timetable. Who cares that I still had three hours before the game? You're cutting into my timetable. I'm starting to rant. I'm going back and forth in the locker room. I'm swearing at everybody. Poor ball boys. God, I, I should probably send them a check. To, you know, they're probably psychologically damaged for life. But I had to have things a certain way. I think the Bombers were uh, 
probably the most significant factor outside of uh, work and family for many, many people in uh, Winnipeg. We were the only professional team uh, in the city at the time. Uh, there wasn't a hockey team, there wasn't a baseball team, and so forth. And of course, in football, you only play eight or ten home games, so these became huge events, uh, and people uh, really supported the Bombers. Uh, companies, uh, the corporate uh, following was extremely good. Uh, I can't say enough about the fans in Winnipeg. Uh, I assume that some of the other cities um, maybe rivaled them, but as far as I'm concerned, they're the best fans I ever saw. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers were always fortunate, and I feel fortunate having played for them my whole career, 11 years, because I think they have some of the best fans in Canada. They support you. Uh, it's not whether you win or lose in this town. It, it seems to be they understand the game. If you go out and play hard, give it everything you've got, if you walk away a loser, they accept that. You know, Winnipeg is a very intense place. Uh, you know, the, the fans are right on top of you. Uh, you know, I can remember uh, some games there where uh, getting the fans out of the game, uh, you know, was as tough as it was dealing with the uh, Winnipeg defense. Winnipeg, fans were nuts. And I think they were nuts because the colder it got, the more fans showed up. And I don't understand that. I guess and I heard that it was said because in the summertime people go to their cottages. In the wintertime they have nothing to do, they come out and dress warm and go to football games. And it's true. And you play out in the prairies, they love their football. Winnipeg fans love football. There is a feeling here today about football in Winnipeg that is as good as I've seen it in the 30 years I've covered the Blue Bombers. Season ticket sales are tremendous. They play to sell out or near sell out crowds every home game and have for the last three years. I won't call it a renaissance because the support and the following and the fans have always been there. Uh, but they're back now and they're all holding up their hands and saying we're here. Winnipeg will always be a great sports city and I say sports city. The biggest thing that happened to Winnipeg that really I think uh, put more emphasis on the Bombers and Winnipeg is when we lost the Jets. When we lost the Winnipeg Jets, I think people thought, you know what, they never thought this could happen. All of a sudden we lost the NHL. The only thing we had left in a professional league at that time was the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I think a lot of people really embraced them after a while and it reawakened their emotions and said, you know what, this is something we can't let die. We've always had a great fan base, but I think it really refreshed in everybody's mind how important it is to the community and to the province to have professional football in Manitoba. The ultimate goal in Canadian football is the Grey Cup. Since 1936, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have experienced the euphoria of capturing the national championship nine times. In 1958, a year after losing his Grey Cup debut, head coach Bud Grant had the Blue Bombers back in the Grey Cup to battle the Tiger Cats for the second year in a row. The hero of the game was Jimmy Van Pelt, a complete football player who seemed he could do it all. Van Pelt scored two touchdowns, kicked two field goals, and four converts for a total of 22 points that set a Grey Cup record. The Blue Bombers emerged with a 35-28 victory for their first Grey Cup championship since 1941. For the third consecutive year, the Bombers and Tiger Cats met again for the Grey Cup at Toronto's CNE Stadium. Leading the Bomber charge was Charlie Shepard. His punting and quick kicking kept Hamilton pinned deep in their own territory. Shepard was also a key to the Bombers' ground attack as he punished the Tiger Cats defense with powerful rushing assaults. Shepard's inspirational performance vaulted the Blue Bombers to a 21-7 victory for their second consecutive Grey Cup championship. In the 1961 Grey Cup, Blue Bombers and Tiger Cats renewed acquaintances and would make Grey Cup history. 
Jerry James and Kenny Plain combined for all but one point of Winnipeg scoring, James recorded a touchdown, two field goals, and two converts. For the first time in Grey Cup history, the game would be decided in overtime. Bomber fan favorite Kenny Plain was the hero as he triumphantly ran into the end zone for the game-winning touchdown in a 21-14 victory over Hamilton. The Blue Bombers were back the following year to face the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the 1962 Grey Cup game that became known as the Fog Bowl. Despite thick fog at Toronto CNE Stadium, both teams played inspiring football. The Blue Bomber running game was powered by the Lincoln locomotive Leo Lewis, who terrorized the Tiger Cat defense with spectacular dashes. In the fourth quarter, with Winnipeg ahead 28 to 27, CFL Commissioner Sid Halter decided to call the game due to poor visibility and resume play the next day. Sunday came, but the score would remain the same as Winnipeg held on to defeat the Hamilton Tiger Cats and celebrate their fourth Grey Cup victory in five years. On a cold Sunday afternoon at Edmonton's Commonwealth Stadium, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers made their first Grey Cup appearance in 19 years against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Former Winnipeg passing sensation Dieter Brock was ready to navigate the Hamilton offense, while ex-Tiger Cat quarterback Tom Clements prepared to engineer the bomber attack. Despite an early Tiger Cat lead, Tom Clements stayed with the game plan. His brilliant play calling began to confuse the Hamilton defense. All of a sudden, Tom Clements was staring at the open prairie as the bomber offense scored with alarming frequency on their way to a 47-17 triumph over Hamilton for their first Grey Cup championship since 1962. At the 1988 Grey Cup game in Ottawa, Blue Bombers met their old Western rival, the BC Lions. With the game tied entering the fourth quarter, Trevor Kennard gave Winnipeg a three-point lead, and the defense took over from there. A critical interception by Mike Gray saved the day as the Lions were in scoring position and threatening to take the lead. In addition to Gray's defensive heroics, another hero emerged as Bob Cameron showcased one of the greatest punting displays in Grey Cup history. Cameron's punts kept Winnipeg out of trouble and scored vital points on their way to a 22-21 victory over the BC Lions. In the 1990 Grey Cup, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers met the Edmonton Eskimos at BC Play Stadium. It was a game the Bombers would dominate from start to finish. Linebacker Greg Battle was a force on the gridiron as the Winnipeg defense smothered the Eskimo offense. The Blue Bomber offensive attack was engineered by quarterback Tom Burgess, who dissected the Edmonton defense with a well-balanced passing and running attack. Head coach Mike Riley and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers would celebrate as they captured the ninth Grey Cup championship in franchise history with a 50-11 triumph over the Edmonton Eskimos. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers continue their rich tradition as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. 
live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, you're a contributor or you're not or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game, in a Canadian football game, with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL put my best foot forward. Whatever it took, I was going to get the job done, and anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play. In the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football, and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. <laughs>